Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, my friend. Today, we are going to cover down on the top seven design use cases to make you a great network designer and have a great, outstanding design mindset. So make sure you listen to this entire video for you to learn all seven of those design use cases. Zig here, and I'm here to help you become the best network designer you can be. Above all else, your mindset is the most important factor of network design. I like to terminize this as a design mindset, design mindset. Remember, it is extremely important to have a good design mindset so you can adapt and be flexible in every single design situation. Again, we're trying to make you successful in every situation you come across. So number one, design use case number one, is Greenfield. Oh, I love Greenfield design use cases. Probably, potentially one of the easiest design use cases we can be in is a Greenfield design use case. Um, what does Greenfield mean? Greenfield means that you are designing something from scratch, meaning there is nothing there, there is no network, no architecture, uh, literally you are designing the environment from scratch. Now that could be a campus architecture, maybe you're building out a new campus, or maybe you're building out a new data center, but there is nothing there. So you get to kind of pick and choose the architectures, the technologies, the solutions that you want to leverage in that space. We don't always get this option as designers. This is usually one of those uh, holy grails, if you will, of a design use case, a greenfield design, outstanding opportunity for us to potentially design a solution from the ground up. Some gotchas. Don't over design the solution, right? Just because it's Greenfield and we can go ahead and plan and design the solution to what we think, what we think is good, doesn't mean it's what's needed, right? We have to base everything back on the requirements of the business, the requirements of the applications, and the requirements of the user base. We can't just deploy a technology or a solution because we think it's needed or we want to do it. A good example might be MPLS traffic engineering tunnels. And if you're deploying MPLS, it doesn't automatically mean you have to deploy MPLS traffic engineering tunnels. There's a lot more complexity involved in some of these solutions. Make sure you don't over-engineer a Greenfield solution. All right, so my next comment on Greenfield. So let's say you're building this data center, right? You're designing it, you're architecting it, it's gonna get built. Well, that doesn't mean that your company or your organization doesn't already have a network per se. Maybe you have a wide area network, maybe you have a campus area network, and you're just trying to add a data center to that mix. So the data center would be Greenfield, brand new, but then your campus network would not, or your wide area network would not be Greenfield, and you're gonna to have to tie them together. So you have to have a plan of how you're gonna tie the wide area network into this new Greenfield design, right? Uh, some things that I like to do is to make sure that you test the new design first before you onboard it into your overall architecture. So something that I would do is a test plan of my data center, making sure from a networking perspective, everything's good to go. If I'm running spy and leaf architectures, if I'm running a ton of virtualization technologies, if I'm doing anything with automation or software to find, like a software to find data center solution, I would go through that whole process and test everything before I go ahead and onboard my data center connectivity into the, the wide area network or the campus network. And then I would do another test plan to test that, hey, yep, my users in the campus or in the wide area network can access this new data center, right? They can actually get to those applications, those services that you're trying to access. And if it's internet or whatever they're trying to access, you just have a test plan to test all of those resources. Second design use case, Brownfield. All right, I find myself doing brownfield designs 90% of the time, and it can be complicated because you don't know what's there. You have to do kind of a, an assessment of the as-is architecture. What is the current state of an architecture and implementation of the current network? If you're a full-time employee of that company, it might be a little easier because you're there every day. You know the architecture, you know the network, but if you are a, a, like a partner or if you are you know, doing multiple customer environments, a contractor, if you will, you're gonna want to take some time, do a discovery of their environment, learn what is going on, right? And then 
go ahead and install some sort of new technology in that brownfield environment, right? Brownfield meaning that environment's been around. It's not brand new. Um, you're literally installing something new in that data center space, right? So the example uh, a minute ago, instead of creating a new data center, you are adding a some solutions into a current data center. Maybe you are adding soft defined data center in a space that you already had a legacy data center architecture. So then you have to add this new data center technology and, and there's multiple options, right? So you could do a lift and shift. I've done that before. Um, traditionally takes some migration planning, some fault tolerance planning. You build out kind of things in new um, where you can, you build out new systems, new, new devices, and then you can either do some virtualization migrations like a V motion. If you're doing some sort of V motion, uh, or you can move the workloads physically, you know, the physical servers can go from one rack in one data center to another rack in the same data center or to another data center. Or you can do what's called not a lift and shift. You can do like a kind of a parallel install where I've done that as well, where you build out a second data center and you have migration links. But the issue with that is it, those migration links end up, end up staying there for a while because it's not going to be a quick, a quick turnaround on that, that, you know, migration, if you will, going to that new, that new brownfielded environment, if you will. In that situation, I'd be mindful of those migration links being layer two. Again, uh, you want to isolate your failure domains. If you're spanning layer two between multiple places, that is one large failure domain. Um, the whole point is that you could have some sort of failure situation that is in one location and it could propagate to another location. So I'm always a fan of doing some sort of fault isolation where appropriate, where I can. All right, so that's Brownfield. Number three. So I have this problem where I can't do three. Like you can't do three. I can't do three. There we go. Three. <laughs> Number three, add and replace technology. Uh, if you're replacing a technology, the driver there is the technology could be better for you, better for the business. You could be a cost saver, a, a business enabler. Maybe there's some additional features that you're going to give with the technology. A good example might be um, if you're running MPLS circuits today, or you have a wide area network, somehow some sort of connectivity on your wide area network. And then maybe you, maybe you decide to add SD-WAN, right? Some sort of SD-WAN architecture and solution because you get some additional benefits from a business perspective and a user perspective to get those cost savings, to get that, that return on its investment. Um, so SD-WAN could be a good, good solution that would provide you some additional capabilities that you didn't have before. So that would be kind of a add or replace technology situation. Now replacing something on that mindset, maybe you're running DMVPN today or some sort of other technology that looks similar to SD-WAN. And instead of being controller based, maybe it's all routing based and you're doing some funky routing or, or distribution. Whereas as you migrate into a different solution, you could easily identify, Hey, yep, we're going to do this add or replace technology. And here's my requirements behind that, my, my reasons behind that. On that note, SD-WAN, if you wanna hear about all the benefits of SD-WAN, I did create a, a fairly new guide on the benefits of SD-WAN. You can easily go to zigbits.tech slash SD-WAN to look at that guide. Number four, number four, all right, mergers. We're gonna talk about a merger. Now, a merger is something that most of us probably wouldn't talk about from a design perspective or a networking perspective or architecture perspective. Why? Why would we talk about mergers? Well, I'll tell you why, right? So if you ever are in a situation where you have your company either acquiring another company or merging with a company, then you're going to be dealing with taking their networks and your networks, and you're going to be putting them together. So you're going to take their networks, your networks, and you're literally going to be putting them together and you have to ensure a number of things. A technology potential issue, overlapping subnets. The old network or the, the, the acquisition network and then your network, you have to make sure that there's no overlapping subnets because the impact of that is that services would not work. So you want to ensure that as you bring in this new network into your network as one architecture, that all the services that that other network had still function in your in the old whole one network. This is a very interesting design use case because a lot goes into this, right? You could have a big merger from an uh, enterprise customer perspective with multiple campuses and multiple data centers, and then what you're going to do is you're going to start to merge 
into kind of a subset of both, right? So if you had two companies with each of them having two data centers, you don't need four data centers potentially. So it's a matter of, okay, well, geographically, where are the data centers? What's the cost of the data centers? Can I migrate these services into two data centers? What's that process, that plan? No matter what you do from a merger perspective, the end result is that you have one architecture, one end-to-end -end architecture, one network that facilitates every line of effort for that business. For them to continually make money, continue making the, the money that they were making, right? But also reduce cost as you can, consolidate, um, resources, consolidate applications, locations, all those things. Reduce the CapEx and OpEx expenses. Can you imagine from a design perspective how many things that you can merge? A good example that could be really complex, two very large service providers merging together with a whole bunch of different services being offered and now you have to do some sort of service kind of catalog migration. You might have to do some sort of complex uh, service provider technologies like inner AS options. Uh, you might have to do carry support carrier. It's a whole bunch of things that come into mergers, right? Mergers bring up two logical networks into one, and it's a great experience to go through. But it is one of those use cases that, that I enjoy because it's highly technical, highly, it can be highly complex, but I'm going to leave you with, make sure you align what you're doing in a merger to the business lines of effort. Number five. All right. So number five is, um, a divestation or divest, um, which is similar to merger, but it's the opposite, right? And, and I would say this is one of the hardest design use cases. And we kind of miss this at times. So think of a divestation where you have one architecture, one honed in, fully optimized, efficient architecture that aligns to the business lines of effort like it's supposed to. But now the business is splitting apart. You have half the business over here and you have the other half over here. And it could, it could actually divest, divest into more than two. And I've been in those situations before where you're divesting into three or four, and that gets really complicated really quick. But let's stick it with two and the same principles applied to the rest, it just as a different level of complexity. So when you have that situation, you had this one network, well now you have to break apart that network and make it into two different networks. But here's the key, each of those networks has to be functional and it has to have all the resources and services that the individual new businesses need to run. And it's on you as a designer to ensure that happens. Let's use an example. I always like example. All right, a good example of uh, uh, how you would do this could be an actual service, or service provider network where you have one core, you have route reflectors, you have services that you're provisioning for your, your users, and then potentially maybe you have like um, a managed services practice as well. So you have this service provider network that you manage, route reflectors, BGP, all this stuff, right? MPLS, L3 VPNs, MPLS, L2 VPNs. But then you also have like maybe a managed services portion of the network. And so when you divest these two functions, you divest the MPLS network services options. So more of those service oriented offerings would go to one business. So that managed services kind of practice, right? That would spin off. That would be more of um, tracking of utilization when they when a customer uses certain services, so you can bill them, bill back process. It could be ticketing system or help desk system. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch that goes into to divest stations, right? Um, I do recommend if you've never done it before that you definitely reach out to someone that has. Get the the lessons learned, right? Because you can't you can't go wrong here. You have to make sure both or all the, the split up businesses with all their corresponding lines of effort are gonna function when this is all said and done. Um, and as a designer, now this is great to add to your skill sets and, and how you can leverage and, and diversify your, your design situations going forward. Number six, all right, number six, we're getting there. So this one is scaling. This is a design use case all about scalability and if a solution scales or not. So once we're done designing a solution and it gets implemented, whatever that solution might be, things can change and that solution may not scale now. The business could change, the priorities, the outcomes, the drivers. It could be a technical change that happened. It could be a direction change that happened. But now that solution just doesn't scale for whatever reason. As a designer, you may not even have been part of that you brought in because, hey, we're having issues, we're having problems, 
You know, maybe it's a, a resource limitation on the, the hardware that they have. Maybe it's an architectural limitation or a design limitation. And so now you have to come in and, and solve that, right? You have to make it scalable. I'll give you an example. So let's say we're gonna merge, we're gonna merge two networks together, uh, which was uh, use case four, right? Merger. So we're gonna go ahead and merge two networks together. And as we merge two networks together, they have overlapping subnets. For the time being, we just can't re-IP everything. We need a short-term solution to handle some of the critical applications that one of those companies has so they can function in both environments. Quick solution, not a good solution, but a quick solution that can leverage NAT, so network address translation. We can do static NATs for those specific services that are critical in the new company, and we can move that into the overall architecture. But that would be a short-term plan. That doesn't scale. That's not a scalable solution. Because if you have 100 services, are you going to do a static NAT for all 100 services? Probably not. I mean, you could, but if I made that scale a thousand services, you're probably not going to do a static NAT for a thousand services. So there's these scalability concerns that come up when you do solutions like this. There's your short-term option. Your long-term option is to re-IP, re-IP the application, right? That's a long-term option, but you have to find solutions that are scalable. Another example could be a protocol scalability issue, like a routing protocol, like OSPF. Maybe maybe the architecture originally could, could scale with the demand, but now as it's grown, there are way too many routers in the OSPF area. Now you need to maybe do, instead of a flat area zero, you need to break it up into multiple areas because there's just too many LSAs going in and out. It is getting flooded constantly. You have to rescale that, that protocol. If that would be OSPF doing multi-area, you could do a ton of different area designs with different area types, and that would be a little bit more scalable. You could also do some sort of LSA3 filtering. These are different options to help mitigate the scalability issues with that protocol. And then of course, you could always replace that protocol. Remember, replace was design use case three, but you could replace OSPF, if it came down to it, to another protocol that is more effective uh, in that architecture, in that design, in that environment. That was scalability. All right, we are at number seven, design failure. So what do I mean about design failure? I mean that, hey, uh, you had a designer, whoever it might be, might be you, might be someone else, came in and did a design for a solution and it failed. Maybe a little bit failed, but it failed. Those situations are like, okay, well, I missed something. I missed a key critical requirement uh, maybe it was a scalability one. Again, that was use case six. Um, maybe it was a security requirement. And so that's why the design failed. Maybe it was a optimization requirement, or maybe it was something as simple as people didn't know how to use the solution. So it just failed. Design failures happen all of the time. Nine times out of 10, we're gonna be brought in as designers to solve design failures. So there's gonna be a protocol, an architecture, a design that's there, and we're gonna have to come in and we're gonna have to solve it. A design failure examples. Let's do something really basic, right? A spanning tree and root bridge locations. So your root bridges, where should they be? And in specifically regards to first hop redundancy protocols. I've had situations where um, some designers have come in and put the root bridges in one location and then put the default gateway for that or the VIP addresses, the virtual IP addresses for VRRP or HSRP or GBLP are not in the same location as the root bridge. There's an underlying issue with that because you could be doing some blocking of some of those links, those redundant links with spanning tree, and your root bridge could be in a different location. Maybe it's over here, whereas your default gateway lives over here. From a design perspective, right, we have to know these different protocols and we have to design them together, not in their own isolation. Again, design's all about all, all the protocols, all the technology together, not just spanning tree, not just VRRP or HSRP or GLBP, but we have to design both those solutions together. But that's a good example of design failure. You know, you're having issues, but you're having potentially things not work because they're in two different locations. I've actually been in a situation where they didn't work. So you have to know the technologies and you have to be able to solve the design failure, both with a short-term solution and potentially a long-term solution. Sometimes they're the same, but not always. Those were our top seven design use cases. If you want to hear more about these design use cases, you can check out zigbits.tech 
slash design mindset. So design mindset, again, that was bits.tech slash design mindset. We are in the process of validating network design course. This week, we are actually finalizing the outline of that course. We're in the final cycle of review. The goal of this course is to make you the best network designer. So let me be specific here. We plan to provide you a design framework that you can leverage in any design situation. If you want to hear more about that, you can feel free to check out this page at zigbits.tech slash network design. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We are following our design mindset theme. So if this is something that's resonating with you, let us know. You can add a comment below as everyone else likes to do. I'm going to start doing things like that below in the comments. You can also go to zigbits.tech. Feel free to add comments where you feel they are appropriate. As always, you can email me at zig at zigbits.tech. Until next time, bye for now.